No, no, I have, uh, I have the record here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The initial recording is what I, I do. I don't do the whole recording. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. But anyhow, it's still record. Okay, so other problems that we have with this fascia is will be the Alzheimer, Parkinson, stroke. So any neurological disorder, especially people with dementia, right? So we have different type of dementia. Alzheimer is not the only one. Alzheimer is going to be one of or many of them. And one of these senile uh, dementia. Senile dementia means uh, with with age, you know you you have less nerve cells, right? You know that, right? With, after yes. 20, after say something age, 65, something, your cells start to go down. All right. And they can lead into pneumonia from aspiration. Okay, so this is something that we already know. Okay, so signs and symptoms and warning of swallowing disorder, reluctance to eat, very slow chewing, fatigue from eating. Fatigue from eating is those people who have problems with COPD, a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, even eat, that effort makes them lack of oxygen. So they have problems, they breathe or they, they breathe or they swallow, and uh, you know, when you are eating, when you are swallowing, you are not breathing, correct? Right? Because the airway is closed, right? So, yeah, is that severe huh? in COPD, in problems of the respira respiratory system? Uh, all right, so complaints of food sticking in the throat. All right, so there is people, I, I don't know, okay, let's talk about that. So it's, it's what we call the skull diverticulum, senkel. Senkel diverticulum. Second diverticulum, if you have this is the esophagus, this is the normal esophagus. The senkel, the, the senkel is going to be like this. So you have a sac here. This senkel, the foot is going to be like in a pouch, it stay there. And this patient starts to smell the food that they ate yesterday. And they're actually foul smell because this become spoiled, whatever. And uh, they are going to have that smell. So that is complaint of food sticking on the throat. Holding pockets uh, on the food and cheeks, like uh, this, like uh, like squirrels, they do it like this, like that, because they have problems to swallow. They are afraid to swallow. Painful swallowing, yes. So when you have a narrowing on the esophagus, narrowing the esophagus, there can be an spasm. The food has got stuck there, and that produces pain. That produces pain, and the patient start to have hypersalivation. The patient start to be not moving; they are sinking, and they feel that it's a pressure here that the foot is trying to go down and down and down and down. But it's painful sometimes. Regurgitation means the uh, gastroesophageal sphincter is 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 um, is relaxed because most likely you have gastritis. When you have gastritis, the gastroesophageal sphincter relax. So that's what is the cause of GERD. So that's why when you eat too much, you have this heartburn. Why? Because too much food, too much gastric acid, too much, that is going to make relax the gastroesophageal. So some gastric acid go up to the esophagus. NCLEX, HESI, you need to make the patient to sit up or to sit up for at least half an hour. Half an hour. Because if you lay down, all the gastric acid go to the esophagus, and the esophagus is not prepared to receive that gastric acid. So what happened? Ulcers. If that is in the long run, these ulcers produce wounds in the esophagus, and they can produce a narrowing, a narrowing of the esophagus. And that needs to be some um, surgical procedure there. All right, so diet adapted to individual needs. So patients, for example, they have different pathologies, or kidney, or heart, or uh, gastrointestinal allergies for gastrointestinal too too uh, too much protein no good when you have liver problems or kidney problems right if you're diabetic you don't want to have too much fat correct okay for example this is um, this is a narrowing this is if you see here this is a fluoroscopy they this is the esophagus and the esophagus should be all the way here the same thickness thickening you see, the same width of the esophagus should be all the way up to here, the stomach. But here's a narrowing. 
So this narrowing is because this is being injured by gastric acid, by gastroesophageal reflux, uh, heartburn, many years, many years, and the tissue start to get tired, start to replace the, the tissue with scars. And that is going to become a narrow of the esophagus. You cannot eat, it's painful, huh? it's painful. I saw patients, very, very, it's painful situation. So they need to eat liquid and soft food. So you need to adapt your situations. So just remember, nutrition, you need to check all the gastrointestinal system. You need to know what is the function, is, is digestion, absorption, and excretion. Akalisha. Akalisha is this narrowing. This, you know, cancers can appear here. So when you have this, this problem of swallowing, the inflammation for many years are going to make the cells being destroyed. And what is the body doing? They are going to regenerate, regenerate, multiply, multiply in order to replace the damaged, damaged tissue. There is so many years of inflammation in that area that the cells do not know anymore. They have a mutation and they do not know when to stop the cell division. And that is where it's going to start growing cells. Cells, that is what is the uh, beginning of a cancer. So inflammation, any part of the body is going to be similar effect. Inflammation for example, in the liver, alcohol. You injure your alcohol inflammation. Inflammation equal to say, deaths are dying, C cells are going to die, cells are dying, cells are dying, inflammation, that is inflammation. And that's what happened, regeneration. One year, 20 years, 30 years, mutation, the cells do not know when to stop, that are the origin of cancer. All right, so, but more than that, uh, we, need, we, don't, we don't have to go there. Just remember what are your nursing considerations when you have this problem. Basically, diet, liquid, to soft dye. So how the patient is going to stand it with the small amounts. Achalasia is that narrowing associated with cancers of the esophagus. Cardio spasm. Cardio spasm. Cardio is not like the heart is having spasm. It's the cardiac area. Cardiac. What is the cardiac area? This area. This area of the stomach. Why is called cardiac? Because it's close to the heart. Okay? And this can produce an spasm. What is the difference between achalasia or cardiospasm? The, the difference is that achalasia is permanent and cardiospasm, like any spasm, is going to be temporary. It's going to take like a few moments and then they're going to relax. Okay? All right. The gastroesophageal reflux. This is something that you need to remember for the exam very well. So when you go to pharmacology, you need to know what is GERD already. When you go to MedSearch 2, uh, I mean, MedSearch 1, 2, so you're going to need that. This is the, gast is the GERD, GERD, if you see here, GERD, 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 is the gastroesophageal reflux disease, okay? And that is because you have too much gastric acid. This too much gastric acid they relax the gastroesophageal sphincter and they can go to the esophagus that is not prepared. The esophagus is not the stomach. The esophagus that with the stomach is the esophagus do not have this thick mucus that is covering the lining of the stomach. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you need to do the upright position of the patient. Upright position is to prevent the reflux going towards the esophagus. So what is this? Mr. Max is a 38-year-old male who has been diagnosed with GERD. Testing revealed he was narrowing his esophagus from GERD. So that means, that is telling me that you have a long run process, uh, a problem with GERD. His symptoms consist of food getting caught in his throat, throat, okay? And frequent and severe heartburn about one hour after eating, after eating. Okay, so, so you can explain that, right? His signal consists in food getting caught in his, his throat. So that means that there is a narrowing of the esophagus and the food cannot progress into the stomach. He also complains of some pain and around the, his jaw and neck. Okay, so what this, 
could be radiation of the pain. So it could be heart, okay? So, oh, okay, so I know what they're telling you this. Because many myocardial infections can resemble, resemble some GERDs. And you, that is what is difficult to differentiate, okay? So, but if the patient is complaining about radiation of the pain, you know, uh, problems of the of the myocardial infarction are produce radiation on the jaw and the and the shoulder, and you can differentiate from uh, um, that this myocardial infarction. No, if you have angina, angina was before. If they don't have angina, probably it's just gastritis. But it's very very commonly that being confused. Oh, it's just a gastritis. No, it was a myocardial infarction. Okay, so be careful, especially with elderly people. Okay, all right. So what they are going to use is the PPI. The PPI is the Prilosec or Lenzeprazole or, or Protonics, whatever you want to. Very good medication. It's not a type. The risk of GERD have erosis esophag esophagitis. So erosion means the uh, wounds or ulcers, ulcers on the esophagus, increase with being overweight, overweight. Why overweight? Yes, overweight is a contributor for GERD. Overweight means too much pressure on the abdominal cavity, pressure that is pushing the, squeezing the stomach, and that at the, uh, what is doing is to relax to the, the sphincter, the gastroesophageal. Plus, the increase of gastric acid can increase the relaxation of the esophageal sphincter. So don't don't lay down. Put, okay. So one thing forget. So somebody is going to do gastritis. No coffee. No tea. No chocolate. No carbonate beverage. Carbonate. Carbonate beverage. Have some bicarbonate. But you said, oh, okay. So don't eat. Why is that? Why does this bicarbonate or carbonated uh, beverage can produce rebound effect? Rebound effect. So. You have gastritis, you take a Coca-Cola or something, you feel relief immediately. But the there's going to be a rebound effect. It's not going to, it's not going to be the treat appropriate for it because it's always coming back even stronger. No spicy food because that irritate the stomach. Uh, tomato and citrus juices. Uh, it's known that uh, when you have gastritis, you need to eat a plain food. Any any colorant or any uh, food that they have a lot of spices and are is colorful basically can lead into increase of gastritis, increase of gastric acid. Smoking or alcohol, smoking, don't smoke. Smoking can produce irritation of the of the stomach and can lead into a, a, a pain and more, more production of gastric acid. Alcohol, uh, alcohol decreases of high irritation. Okay. Uh, alcohol, alcohol, alcohol itself. The the just the contact of the alcohol with the stomach inside that can produce an increase of gastric acid. So you you taking alcohol, you're going to have this uh, increase of gastric acid. Okay. Increase lean protein. Oh, okay. Why lean protein? So don't think about the protein. So why using the protein instead of, see, fat? Tell me, when you have gastritis, you eat more fat? When you have gastritis, you eat bacon? No. Why? No. You need, acid, you need more acid to break down the fat. Excellent, excellent. So the fat is going to take longer to be the to be digested. It's going to take longer in the stomach. That means that you are going to produce more gastric acid. Very, very good. Okay. I think we can, can we do our lunch break right now, like 11, 15 minutes before 12 until 12, 16?
Okay. Yes. Yeah, and then we can continue the whole class. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. So I will see you at twelve sixteen. Okay. Okay. All right. See you then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. All right, so let's start. All right, so let's continue. Uh, cameras, please. Ms. Uh, Ms. Anne. Uh, Ms. Ivona, Ms. Mia. Ivona, okay. All right, so one of, one of the scenes I really you to know is about GERD, okay? GERD. So this is something that you must remember, GERD. GERD, gastro, easy to remember, esophageal, reflux. Ref what, mean, what does it mean, reflux? Somebody, please. We have long class reflux. I'd like to come back up. I don't, yeah, exactly. Yeah, in, in, in your own words, that is means reflux. So, is the uh, the gastric acid that are going to go no forward but go, uh, post, uh I mean, to previous audience from the stomach go to the gastric acid that go from the stomach to the esophagus, okay? And what you're going to do with this? So basically, how many of you have a, 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 a heartburn? It's called pyrosis, pyrosis, pyrosis. The terminal, the, ter the medical term is pyrosis, okay, pyrosis. So that means heartburn. So the patient, is, you can tell heartburn, you're not going to tell the patient pyrosis. They doesn't know what is pyrosis. So you need to translate in your in your mind, right? So, and what you need to do? So NCLEX, always they're telling you, you need to sit up the patient for at least half an hour after meals. And avoid, avoid substances like alcohol, like spices, like uh, chocolate, like uh, 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 alcohol, spices, chocolate, uh, for a uh, hot, 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 uh, hot food. So too hot can produce gastritis too, right? So all these candy, ca chocolates, they're going uh, not to eat too much fat. Fat is taking longer to digest. So it's going to be longer time stay in place in the stomach. So more time in the stomach, the stomach is going to produce more gastric acid. So that's why you, when you have gastritis, you eat less, less, uh, less what? Less fat. Okay? Are you okay with that? Yes, Dr. G. Remember, yes. thank you, thank you. Remember that the stomach is going to start to evacuate the food in half an hour. And the stomach is going to be completely empty after two hours you start to eat. So two hours, okay? So that is very important. All right, so hiatal hernia. Just to show you, there's other, other they can produce problems with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the nutrition, right? So this hernal, uh, hiatal, hiatal hernia, there is two types, Blake and whatever, Morgan. So we don't care about that. So what I want is to tell you is this. So can you see the so the stomach, the stomach, the stomach and the esophagus? Here is the gastroesophageal sphincter. This is diaphragm, the diaphragm. When you have too much pressure on the stomach, especially patients with obesity or some congenital malformations in very early stages, the stomach are going to pass to to from the abdomen to the thorax because uh, here above the diaphragm is the thorax and that is going to produce a protrusion a piece a piece of the of the of the stomach that produces a lot of pain and besides that what you have here in this area is the heart so it's going to make some uh, some compression around so uh, that is it's a congenital it can be repaired by uh, some surgery 
peptic ulcer disease. All right, so please, 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 we are going to see this in pharmacology too. Peptic ulcer disease, PUDs, PUDs. Listen to this very careful. PUDs is an ulcer that can be can be in the stomach or and the duodenum. So duodenal ulcers and gastric ulcers are called PUDs. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this gastric ulcer, if you see here, the esophagus, because the esophagus is not the stomach, it's not the mucus is not prepared for that. That can produce basically if you have an ulcer here, this is an ulcer, and you do this, do the you have a wound here and you do this with your hands like this. It's going to start being and it's start it's going to be in pain, correct? So the same thing, if you have an ulcer in the esophagus. The, the food, when the bolus, when it's going to pass through the esophagus, they're going to do like this. So they're going to open the, uh, the, the wound, the ulcer. And that ulcer basically is going to happen in the first 10 seconds, 15 seconds after you start to ingest all the glutition of the, of the, of the bolus. So that is the location. So the pain starts almost immediately after you swallow. That is an ulcer that is in the, in the esophagus. If the ulcer starts in the first half an hour, in the first half an hour, that means that the ulcer is going to be doing this because the, 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 the chyme now is going to produce mechanical forces over the, over the uh, ulcer, and they are going to start reactivating the ulcer, means pain and bleeding. Okay, if after half an hour, after, 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 after half an hour, the pain start to increase, that means that the, the ulcer is, is basically in that duodenum, because in half an hour is where the foot start, the chyme start to pass into the duodenum. Are you okay with that? And this pain characteristically, because you need to evacuate in the next two hours, right? Up to two hours after you 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 start eating, the pain starts to be in crescendo. They are going to be more intense, intense, intense until the foot is gone from the duodenum, and that the ulcer start to uh, the pain start to be lower. So that is the location of the ulcer. So you can tell. Imagine a patient, somebody who has ulcers in your family or friends around. So the the question that you need to do is at what time of uh, at what time it start to be the pain, right? At the very beginning, in the, in the first half an hour, or after half an hour, okay? Or it could be it could be both in the stomach or in the duodenum. So in that case, the the pain is going to start in half an hour, and uh, between the the first thirty minutes, and then the pain start to increase even more after half an hour, after two hours. So that means that they have ulcers in the stomach and in the in the intestine, small intestine. Duodenum, duodenum. Is that clear or not? Clear. Yes, sir. All right, so the main thing is to avoid acid stimulation. That's what they put here. And how we are doing that? No spices, no chocolate, no coffee, right? No, for example, a meat with a whole milk. So probably you see low in fat, right? Or a, 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 no smoking. A smoking can produce increase of gastric acid too. Okay, we got it? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. So malabsorption. So please, the first thing to keep in your mind, malabsorption in your mind, when I, when I said malabsorption, whenever you heard malabsorption, the first thing that is coming to your, to your mind is, is fat. Fat that is not digested. No digestion of fat, malabsorption. The characteristic of malabsorption is a diarrhea that is very fetid. Fetid means very strong smell and it's yellow. It's like a mass. It's like a mass. Characteristic of this diarrhea is going to be like the toilet. I told you that before. The toilet, you need to even flush it twice. Why? Because this uh, mass is fat basically floating so mostly they're not going very difficult to pass so you even you flush it twice one time two, two times and it's very fatty very very it's that is called 
estiato ria. Estiato, 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 please write it down, means fat means fat and what could be that what could be and you can tell me now you are prepared to say that so what is a malabsorption can be caused can be caused by example low amount of bile you don't produce enough bile that can happen in patients who have removed the gallbladder so the the bile in that case without gallbladder the bile be leaking into the duodenum permanently permanently but in the same amount. The difference to have a gallbladder is that the gallbladder can regulate the amount of bile that is needed for the food you're eating. If you eat more fat, more meal, the bile is, the gallbladder is going to contract more and is going to send more bile to the more amount of food that you're eating. If you eat a little bit, the gallbladder will not contract that much and that is going to be uh, the amount enough to digest the, the time that is passing into the duodenum. But if you have a removal of the of the gallbladder, the, the most likely if you eat a lot, the bile is not going to be enough to digest the fat that is in that big meal. Because when you don't have gallbladder, it's not going to regulate the amount of bile secreted. It's going to be constant, 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 and the same. Make sense or not? Yes, makes sense. And the other one, thank you. And the other one is the pancreas. Pancreas. Pancreas, they have the lipase. So in order to digest the fat, you need the bile acid and you need the lipase. The bile acid, bile acid, bile acid, bile acid is the emulsifier, is the one who turns the fat from drops to droplets to increase the surface area of contact with the lipase that is coming from the pancreas and that produces a very successful digestion. Okay? Yes. Other, oh, thank you. Other is going to be uh, celiac disease. Is uh, We are going to talk about that, cystic fibrosis, so many others. But the main concept here is what I want is malabsorption. What is coming in your mind? Fat not digested. Fat is not digested. And the fat not digested cannot be absorbed. The fat cannot be absorbed in the digestion because of bile acids or lack of, pancre of um, pancreatic use that include the lipase. So what happened? There is high concentration of fat in the lumen of the intestine. So higher concentration inside versus low concentration outside of the, of the intestine. What is trying to do the body is to dilute the high concentration inside the intestine so water start to come in and uh, this excess of fat can produce an inflammation reaction that increase the peristalsis of the intestine and this combination produce that diarrhea you okay with that yes yes now cystic cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis can cause malabsorption why is that all right, so when you, cystic fibrosis is very common to see in anklets. Cystic fibrosis is going to happen when, uh, what is, is a congenital, is a gene, gene, genetic disease. And this is a dominant, you know, it's a recessive uh, uh, cyst, uh, process where all the secretions, cystic fibrosis, all secretions in the body get thicker, very thick. So what we need to do with uh, with this? So one of the problem is that the cystic fibrosis is going to make thicker the pancreatic use, thicker the pancreatic use. So that is going to be secreted very slow, very slow because the pancreatic you become very thick. It's like a tooth, not not like a toothpaste, but no, it's not liquid that's supposed to be. It's going to be more dense, and that can lead into a decrease of amount of lipase that is gaining into the duodenum produce malabsorption. Other consequences of cystic fibrosis is not related only for the GI tract. Other secretions will be increased too. Other, or incre I mean, other secretions will be more thicker too. So the other one is the uh, bronchial, bronchial secretions. The bronchial secretions. So bronchial secretions become very thick and that is very difficult to eliminate, giving the chance of the bacteria to proliferate and produce an infection. 
And basically, the main problem for cystic fibrosis will be pneumonias. Pneumonias. Basically, they die of... In the past, they was dying about 15, 16 years uh, old. Now, they can go up to 50, 60 years old uh, span life. Okay? All right, so the nutrition supplement. So here we have the nutrition management is, a, first of all, enzyme replacement, right? So we have, uh, we have uh, that is pharmacology one or two, I'm, I'm not remember, but they have pharmacology two. Is the acetylcysteine that is basically going to put the, uh, in the bronchial secretion to make it more thinner. And in the GI tract, what we need to do is supplements of lipase, lipase, right? Lipase, basically is that. High calorie promote, high calor, uh, calorie promote uh, uh, nutrition supplements to maintain weight. So that is important because you are not able to digest fat. So you need to do a small amounts during the day, during the day, during the day. Break down the meals in small portions. And high caloric intake, like, for example, your high quality proteins, your carbohydrates, and the uh, light and the fat, they need to decrease because you cannot digest fat. They can produce diarrhea, malabsorption. The IBD, IBD, that is a chronic inflammatory disease. Okay, IBD, IBD is a chronic inflammatory gastric disease. That is an autoimmune disorder. Autoimmune disorder. We have two of these. We have the, if you see in the picture on the left, the Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease, and the CUC. It's called the ulcerative colitis. CUC. So some it's called ulcerative colitis. Sometimes it's called UCUC. It's chronic ulcerative colitis. This is a chronic disease. And what happened, if you see here, let's start with the easy one, the uh, the chronic ulcerative colitis, colitis means colon, colon, colon. And mostly what happened here, and this autoimmune disorder, what is going to happen is produce ulcers. Ulcers are going to produce ulcers. So we are going to produce ulcers. So this can happen in CUC. But in Crohn's disease, it can happen in any part of the body, from the mouth to the rectum. Okay, so colon sigmoid especially. But all about, all the GI tract can be affected in the Crohn's disease. So what is going to happen is that inflammation can produce increase of the peristalsis. So the time of absorption will be, will be shorter. So for that, you need to, you have, again, you need to eat something that is easier to digest easy to digest, of course, with a treatment that is needed to decrease the inflammatory process of these two diseases, IBD. IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, is the umbrella for Crohn's disease and CUC. So for this, again, we need to increase high quality proteins and uh, decrease the amount of fat that is going to be more difficult to, to, to digest. And in addition, irritants that can produce a lot of free radicals, spices, chocolate, smoking. So those are alcohol. Alcohol is prohibited here. Okay, so we talk about that. So a patient should be avoid food that upset the intestines, right? So such, for example, seasoned foods, that is a spicy food, raw fruits, so it could be basically, say, uh, cook, uh, boil, in order to make it easier to be digested, okay? Milk, for example, lactose, if you're uh, intolerant to lactose or forget it about milk, not even 2% uh, diet, so you need to take some supplements. So, Crohn, uh, Crohn disease and CUC are really, really not a, a game, seriously. It's, uh, the patient is having a lot of limitations. So, in the diet, you need to increase a low-fiber diet, Okay, so uh, that uh, and a lot of fluid. That is actually the trick here for ulcerative and Crohn's disease. So the the thing is, we don't want this the food stay longer in the in the body. So we want food in the CUC and Crohn's disease something easier to digest, and and as a consequence, it is going to be easier the absorption. 
All right, so talking about diarrhea. Diarrhea is the increase of number of bowel movement, movement and increase of liquid fluid. Diarrhea, diarrhea, diarrhea. Diarrhea, we have four different types of diarrhea. I'm going to talk about that. You don't need to know that uh, at this moment. But di diarrhea is going to be depends on what you have, what is the patient habits. When you are talking about constipation or diarrhea, you need to assess the patient, you need to have your clinical history of the patient, knowing what are the habits of the patient for bowel movement. Some people, the, the normal bowel movement go from one or three times a day to two times per week. That is normal. Some people, they go poo every two days, right? But if you, if you have less than that, that is constipation, for example. If the patient is having, uh, for example, bowel movement every three days, and suddenly one day he start to do or she start to do three, four times in three times in a day, it's normal for some people. For this special person, it's not. It's going to be different. So that's why the habits of the patient of bowel movement need to be assessed always. So you cannot call diarrhea or constipation uh, if you don't do that uh, first of all investigation. Okay. So, but, uh, but diarrhea is the increase of number of bowel movements as increase of fluid. Peristalsis, when there are increase, increase the number of depositions. And why is water? Because that the transportation of the food is so fast that there is no time to absorb the water from the intestines, and that can lead into increased number of fluid in the depositions or uh, in the in the stools and increased number of uh, BMs, okay? So basically what I want you just to remember here is diarrhea, no, you are not loose, you are, basically what is happening, you don't have the absorption. So you can get into low levels of, uh, of nutrients getting into your body. So that is a skill. Oh my God. So, Sorry, I will come back in 30 seconds. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so that is diarrhea, right? I was saying something that I was in the middle. We okay with that with diarrhea? Oh, oh, okay. Let's see what well, you don't remember. Remind me. Okay, so diarrhea. Basically, you are going to lose electrolytes in addition and electrolytes, electrolytes, electrolytes. So you need to replace that fluid always in diarrhea. Remember, three days in adult, you must go to the doctor. One day with diarrhea in infants or children, you must go to the doctor, okay? So what is worse, diarrhea or vomiting? In the, from the point of view of electrolytes. Vomiting. Vomiting. <clears throat> Even though the diarrhea have more volume eliminated, looks like it's uh, more loss, no. but. In the gastric acid, we have higher concentration of electrolytes, and that is with small amounts with high concentration of electrolytes. So vomiting is you're losing more electrolytes than diarrhea. Okay. Diverticulosis. Diverticulosis is another thing that is a, can produce some problems, very serious problems. Here we have the uh, peristalsis. This peristalsis somehow is abnormal. So these peristalsis you see here, they are going to 
be the kind of peristalsis, always peristalsis pushing the foot forward towards the anus. But in some cases, there is some no coordination of the masoner of the hour back plus that I think you're going. You, you have Mr. Verda as your teacher. He likes to talk about masoner and hour back plexus. So these plexus are a group of nerves, a group of nerves that are going to be innervating the muscle of the of the of the intestine. Innervation, please. Innervation. Okay, I'm going to put it here. This is a word that we are going to use. Innervation. Innervation means the the nerves in contact with the tissue. Innervation. So more innervation, they have more nerves. Less innervation, less nerves. So innervation nerve nerve is going to be the a link between the nervous system and the in this case the smooth muscle. Okay. So this innervation is going to be caused by two plexus. I'm going to mention before okay, the hour back and the Meissner plexus. This plexus is plexus means a group of nerves where are located in the wall of the intestine. And sometimes they have some um, some variations, some changes, and the peristalsis is going to be changing. So peristalsis can go for move forward and and for some reason, they start to move backward. So that is going to increase the uh, the the uh, material in one area, and that's going to basically what is going to increase pressure. And when they increase pressure, look at this. They squeeze at the same time the the same volume here, the same volume of fecal material are going to get trapped, and but the, this area gets smaller. So the pressure is going to be higher in the in the middle. And that is going to make bulging the mucus, a weak area, weakest area, some weakest areas on the intestine. This pressure is going to make like a finger glove coming out, out from the mucus of the intestine. If you see here, all the there is lumen, there is there is the wall of the intestine, and produce a cool de sac that is a, like a finger like uh, uh, eventration. So it's going to protrude, and that is important. That is important for one reason. Now that you have the, that is called diverticulosis. That is not mostly happening one time. It can be one, two, three, even more, right? So this diverticula or diverticulosis, that is the process that formed a diverticula. So that is very dangerous. Why? Because there is some fecal material they can get trapped in this sac inside. And when it is not moving, the, the fecal material starts to proliferate bacteria. They produce an inflammation and produce the perforation of the intestine. Now the diverticulosis changes name, and that is called diverticulitis. The diverticulitis. Diverticulitis. Okay? All right, so we do have formation of. of the, the main thing we are going to do is to create a good formation of the stools. And for that, you need to have an increase of fiber in these cases. This diverticulitis is painful. It's very painful. It's a diffuse abdominal pain that can happen basically after meals. And if you have this problem can produce a perforation Fecal material go to the GI, uh, to the abdominal cavity, produce infection, sepsis, septicemia, uh, septicemia, sepsis, and actually multisystemic infection. All right, so that is the diverticulitis. So this, we have here the pockets, the pockets of the diverticulum. And if you have a very kind of mass without fiber, that mass can get into these small pockets. And that can produce a problem of diverticulitis. Okay. Okay, so let me see how much I have. Okay. Okay, now this is the irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome. Irrit so, so this is different from inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. So this is irritable bowel syndrome. It's different. Irritable bowel, bowel uh, syndrome is those people who want to go to the bathroom. They go to the bathroom 
and they push, 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 and push, and there is nothing to come out. Or they come a little bit with all the effort, then they they uh, they go out of the bathroom in about 10 seconds, one minute or 10 minutes, they want to come back to the bathroom again. And they want to poo, to poo, and there is nothing coming out. This is basically problems with psychological, emotional problems. So patients who are very apprehensive, very nervous, very anxious all the time, they are actually, is going to affect the GI tract, okay, the GI tract. So, and that produces, if you see here, an, lack of coordination, lack of coordination between the peristalsis. So uh, that is basically the inflammatory process can increase the sense or give the perception of that you want to go to the bathroom, but it's not. So there is nothing to evacuate at that time. Okay. So a prophylaxis, psychoprophylaxis, so the patient needs to be in relaxed time. The stress, the stress is going to be a trigger here. The more straight you go, the more you go to the bathroom. Okay. All right. So normalize eating patterns. Uh, all right. So your balanced diet. Eliminate food allergens or intolerance. So everything that is spicy. So anybody. So far, you can tell that any the, the diverticulitis can be worse with alcohol, with uh, with chocolate, with the smoking, with the spicy food. So any of these any problem so far that we have, that we see, that you have any problem with the GI tract or the GI system, avoid all these uh, inflammatory uh, substances that what is doing is free radicals, right? When you see when you say inflammation, I have inflammation, that means that there's a huge amount of radicals and that means destruction of the cells. Inflammation equals destruction of cells, okay? <coughs> Sorry. Salud. Bless you. Okay. In, uh, <coughs> all right. Constipation, we already talked about that. So in constipation, in constipation, uh, you will see constipation in the facilities. There is many drugs that can produce constipation. One of the drugs, the drug, drugs that you need to remember are, I'm not going to say names, but the uh, so the anticholinergics, anticholinergic. Remember, anticholinergics, everything dry, right? So cholinergic. So please listen to me carefully, please. When I said cholinergic, means acetylcholine, right? So that is everything wet. But when I said anticholinergic, anticholinergic. So basically, so those are anti-acetylcholine are going to be making everything, everything dry. Okay, we got that? So yeah. some anticholinergic medication, uh, some medications, especially when you have antidepressants, whatever, so they can lead into constipation. And constipation, uh, one of the things is that you commonly will see is in a post-op, post-operative. When the patient in post-op is is desire and is we need to promote the deambulation. Deambulation means walking. So even in the first 24 hours, they need to work, stand up and go to the bathroom, pulling his his whatever bottle of of uh, dextrose or sodium chloride, whatever he's having. Go with. They need to go to the bathroom. Why? Why they need to walk? Because walking stimulates the peristalsis. If the patient do not do stools in the first 24 hours, the patient need to receive some stool softeners. Why? Because in two days, days if the stool is not being, uh, uh, I mean, evacuated, or that means that the stool was longer time with a large intestine, and it was, uh, a water is going to be absorbed, and you, what we call this, fecal impactation fecal impactation that's what we call fecal impact what is that Fec oh God. okay my god my nose it's called fecal impactation impactation so the instead you have a stool you have a brick there you have a brick so 
Why? Because it's very hard, because the intestine was passing so long time there, the, the fecal material that absorbs all the water, it's trying to get dry. So for this, you need to increase the, the fiber, you need to increase fluids, a lot of fluids, a lot of fluids, and uh, how much fluid? M uh, minimum is two liters, so you need to take about a, how much is two liters? Two liters is going to be like four, uh, four, uh, four, four to eight glasses of, no, four glasses of fluid, a full glass. Um, and you need to increase probably up to 3,000, depends. So for that the patient, what they're going to have is fluid by IV. When the patient is having the dextrose, right? But definitely it's better to do everything PO. Increase fibers to make the formation of the of the stools. Allergies. So food allergies, we have the uh, allergies is, for example, the gluten. Gluten. Gluten is a protein. Gluten looks like sounds like a ghost, but this gluten is not glucose. Gluten is a protein. Gluten, gluten is a protein. So you have allergies to the gluten. So that is different from uh, food, uh, I mean, for intolerance to the lactose. Intolerance to the lactose, intolerance to the lactose, so produce diarrhea, produce diarrhea. Celiac disease or gluten allergies, gluten allergy produce diarrhea too, that is in common. The, pro the difference is that in the food intolerance, like in the lactose, you do not have an enzyme that is going to break down the lactose into glucose and galactose. So this lactose that is not digested will be accumulated, produce inflammatory process, in focal inflammatory process, increase peristalsis, and produce diarrhea. So Dr. In G oh, yes. So does that mean that the patient doesn't have lactase? Exactly, lactase. The enzyme who is breaking down the lactose is the lactase. Lactase enzyme. The lactose, they need an enzyme to break it down. It's called the lactase. The maltose, that is a disaccharide, they need to have another enzyme called the maltase. And the and the um and the sucrose in order to break it down, that is a disaccharide into glucose and fructose, they need to have the sucrase enzyme. In this case, the most common is the lactose intolerance. In this case, there is no participation of the immune system. That is the big difference with the allergies. In the celiac disease or gluten, 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 uh, uh, gluten, gluten allergies, are going to be this food, basically they have grains, the cover of the grains, they have actually this uh, gluten that is a protein. So the wheat, the, I don't know, other, other, other seeds, the uh, uh, rye, rye, is one rye. Okay, so these grains, if they don't take the cover that contain gluten, they can produce this. So many, many uh, foods, they have gluten, so you need to eat gluten free. Okay, and remember, allergies, the gluten allergies is caused by a protein and participate the immune system. Yes, immune system. In the intolerance, there is no immune system participating. Is The cause is basically the lack of an enzyme. Okay, so this is the celiac disease. So basically, it's going to be gluten-free diet. Oh, so liver disease, steatohepatitis. Steatohepatitis is called the fatty liver. Fatty liver. This fatty liver, this fatty liver is the accumulation of fat in the in the liver. Steato means fat. Hepatitis, epa means liver. Itis, inflammation. Yes, the accumulation of fat in certain amount, they are going to lead into inflammation of the liver, leading into hepatitis, type of hepatitis. This steatohepatitis, those who like to eat a lot of cholesterol, you know the liver produces cholesterol, right? Yes or no? The liver produces cholesterol, yes or no? Yes? Yes? Right? Yes. 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 And this cholesterol, when it's in excess, can produce an inflammatory process. So a lot of free radicals destroy, destroy, destroy the the cells of the liver. 
So this steatohepatitis, you see, oh, it's just fat in the liver, fatty liver. No, they can lead into hepatitis. They can lead into cirrhosis. The, the good news about this, if you eat your, your diet, uh, in your diet, is low in cholesterol, low in fat, the, and high uh, in, in fiber and, and vegetable, right? So that is going to be cleared out in about six months. Six months, okay, six months. Hepatitis, please, please, with this, I don't want you to think that hepatitis is just because of virus, hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, and F. Yeah, we have uh, hepatitis F. G is not discovered yet, but it's, it's, it's around there. So anyhow, so we have different type of, but this is not the only cause of hepatitis. We, I'm showing you the fat, accumulation of fat in the liver can lead into hepatitis too. Other substances can produce hepatitis. For example, uh, 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 if somebody wants to kill himself with uh, drinking Windex, for example, or any solution, any chemical, the one who is going to pay price is the liver happening hepatitis, hepatitis. Mushrooms, I'm not saying whatever, uh, the mushroom that we have in the market, no, that's not. But these mushrooms will grow in the, in the, in the, in the wild, in the wilderness or in the grass, whatever, to be careful. Because if you eat them, they can produce hepatitis. It's very have anticholinergic uh, substances. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, what if we doing in hepatitis? You know, what are the functions of hepatitis? A, B, C, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, albumin, B, bile, just to refresh. C, third is the coagulation factors, and D is the detoxification of the of the substance. So, hepatitis that means the liver is limping, is not working full. All right. So. For that, you need to make, uh, you need to uh, have high quality proteins, right? Low fat, low fat, okay? And a lot of fluids. High carbohydrates too. So basically easier to digest. One of the enemy of the gastrointestinal is to eat fat, right? Fat is more difficult to digest. It's taking longer time, produce gastritis, can produce more gastric acid production. Can you see this liver? That is a cirrhosis already. Can you see these granulomas? Those are the regeneration that happened. This is a micronodular, micronodular. One is for alcohol, the other one is for uh, some hematocoma. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about what is cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is going to be the replacement of the tissue. So you know that the liver when it's having is under injury, what means injury of the liver? The destruction of the cells. And what's supposed to be the liver doing? Going to replace the cells for new cells, for replacing the all the cells who are being killed or damaged or destroyed. So, but example, alcohol. Alcohol. In alcohol, they can produce hepatitis too. And alcohol is being injury, the injure the, the liver for one day, for one year, for 10 years, every single day for 20 years. And the liver, so some, the cells, in some moment, they make a mistake. They make a mutation and the cells do not know when to stop the, the regeneration. Because if you have, for example, right now, you, you pass nutrition, you pass module one, oh, let's celebrate, let's have some zombie or vodka or whatever you want. So your liver is going to enter into hepatitis, but you're not drinking every day. So this alcohol is going to be just eliminated and the liver start to regenerate and the liver stop to regenerate because everything is in place already. But with alcohol, you alcoholism, you keep drinking, drinking, drinking. There is a moment after so many years that the liver doesn't know, the cells doesn't know when to stop. They make a mutation and that is the origin of cancers. They can, cirrhosis, some people call precancer. It's not necessary cirrhosis precancer, but they can lead into cancers. Okay, uh, what is cirrhosis? By the way, cirrhosis will be that the 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 liver is tired to be um, regenerating all the time. That the liver start to instead to produce cells, 
new cells are going to be replaced by fibrous tissue, scars. These scars are retractile and the liver from 18 to 22 centimeters by 10 to 12, they are going to shrink to the half because the fiber, fibrotic tissue is going to actually shrink the liver and that is cirrhosis. So that are going to lead into other pathologies that you're going to see in of in MedSearch 2 with Mr. Verda. Hepatic encephalopathy. So the detox, hepatic encephalopathy, ABCD, the detoxification. If you have cirrhosis, if you have cirrhosis, and that is nutrition too. So you have cirrhosis, so you tell me what you're going to do. So if you have cirrhosis, the liver do not, uh, you know, when you have excess of proteins, the proteins are not going to be a store so they are going to be deaminated. The excess of proteins are going to be deaminated. And this deamination are going to make the deamination of the amino acids, right? So they are going to lead into ammonia, ammonia, ammonia. This ammonia is taken by the liver and transformed in urea. That is much, is less, less toxic than the excellent deal from ammonia to urea is an excellent deal even though urea is toxic but ammonia is 10 15 times more toxic so and that when you have cirrhosis is not going to occur so ammonia cannot be taken by the liver and cannot transform in urea so what happened ammonia start to accumulate in the blood and they one of the target or one of the organs will be mostly affected is the central nervous system and you start to have loc the mental status start to change and what happened that is called the encephalopathy hepatic encephalopathy hepatic encephalopathy so in order to prevent this hepatic encephalopathy there is many many ways to do it so we are going to have, for example, a lactulose, that is a medication that is going to help to uh, get rid of the ammonia. Uh, that, is, that is part of physiology, it's not your time, it's not related to nutrition. But the other thing is to avoid excess of proteins. So that is your diet in this type of patients. Decrease the to the minimum that the needs of protein. And you need to be careful with that. This is special calculations, whatever, in order not to make the patient uh, 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 get into malnutrition or undernutrition. Are you okay with that? Yes. 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 Gallbladder disease. Thank you. The gallbladder disease, if you see this called gall stones, gall stones. It's not is please don't get don't get confused please these stones basically are not calcium calcium are in the kidney kidney stones there's a type of kidney stones too in the in the in the kidney but in the gallbladder in the gallbladder the gallbladder is going to mostly the 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 stones that you see is cholesterol remember the the gum under your table when you touch under your table, you see a gum, you feel a gum. That is the texture of the of the cholesterol when it's in the gallbladder. Why I know that? Because I, well, I remove gallbladders and I open and I see the, the cholesterol. So, but there is not the only one type of uh, gallstones. They have bilirubin, especially on other, other elements. Bilirubin, uh, stones of bilirubin mostly they are very blue greenish very nice color by the way and you need to do is to decrease your um, your intake of fat okay fat because cholesterol is basically female are more prone to have gall stones why because estrogens one of the many functions of the estrogens and remember fertile age between 14 to 44 years old are going to be 45 years old is the time that you have the highest level of estrogens. These estrogens or their multiple functions is to promote the, promote the excretion of cholesterol through the bile. So that is what is doing estrogen, one of the many other functions. So estrogens can help the elimination of cholesterol through the bile. 
So that's why females do not have, in that age, do not have myocardial infarctions as often as males with the estrogens in that amount. So we are not having that protection. So uh, cholesterol will be mostly deposited in the arteries in, ma in males, but in females, mostly they go to the gallbladder. In the gallbladder, the cholesterol, they're going to find the bile. The bile is, as you know, the bile is composed by, by cholesterol plus water plus electrolytes plus bilirubin plus bile acid. So it's a cocktail of, of, of substances uh, that is the bile. So the cholesterol go to the, to, the, to the gallbladder where you have the bile there and the cholesterol need to be dissolved by these elements. You have the bile acid, so the bile acid is going to help to do that, right? Drop to droplets inside the gallbladder. So what happened here is that when you eat too much cholesterol, the cholesterol is going to saturate the bile. Saturation of the bile with the cholesterol means that the cholesterol will precipitate as crystals in the in the gallbladder. And that is going to start accumulating through the years, producing gall stones. We okay with that? Yes, sir. So we have a term called a litiasis. Cholelithiasis means that the, the presence of a stone in the gallbladder, okay? There are going to be no signs and symptoms most of the time. There is no signs and symptoms. When, they, when, you have bile, uh, when you have signs and symptoms, that is called the biliary colic. Colic. Colic means like a spasm. Biliary colic. This biliary colic should be last less than four hours. Less than four hours. If there is, if there is more than four hours, that is telling you that this cholelithiasis, biliary colic, is going to be called uh, cholecystitis. Cystitis. That is already an inflammation and infection. So if your biliary colic lasts more than four hours, you must go to the doctor, to the hospital. No doctor, to the to the hospital immediately because that is already infected infected okay we got it yes talking about pan uh what time is it for heaven's sake is one eight okay so talking about pancreatitis pancreatitis is an organ that uh okay so it's a retroperitoneal organ is you have the if you open your abdomen you will find first of all the liver you put pull up the liver, you find the stomach. You pull the stomach, you will see the pancreas. The pancreas is behind the stomach and is very behind, we call in the retroperitoneal space. Uh, another time I will explain if you want that. But anyhow, so the pancreas is an endocrine, uh, an exocrine gland. So endocrine, the insulin, glucagon, the somatostatin, and the PPP, the P, double, double P, sorry, and the exocrine is the pancreatic use. Pancreatitis is an inflammation of the pancreas. So you need to remember your anatomy, your anatomy and physiology here. So there is two, two causes of pancreatitis. One cause is the alcoholism and can produce pancreatitis. You can you can with the pancreas because what is above the what is above the pancreas we have is in contact with the spleen and is above the pancreas we have the diaphragm, the diaphragm. The diaphragm, and you will tell you why why it's important. So pancreatitis is this. You need to remember a few things here. But, and the other one is gallstones. Gallstones. How can gallstones? Gall so there is two causes, main causes of pancreatitis: gallstones and alcoholism. Gallstones and alcoholism. So I'm going to explain you now. Remember, in bioscience, we was talking that the enzymes basically are going to be activated, mostly of them, in most of the enzyme will be activated in pH that is neutral, close to seven. That is number one you need to remember. So the enzymes are going to be activated when they are in neutral environment, close to seven. This is number one. Number two, 
the pancreas have the pancreatic juice where is the, the lipase, the protease, and the amylase, those are enzymes. Question is why these amylase, protease, and, amyl, uh, and lipase do not digest the liver? Do not digest the liver. The, sorry, the pancreas. Uh, do not digest the pancreas. Why this pancreatic juice do not auto digest the pancreas? Because the pancreas is a tissue. The tissue, the cell is composed by cells, and cells have have carbohydrates. They have fat and they have proteins. How, how come this lipase protease and the amylase do not digest the pancreas? Why? Because the pH of the pancreatic juice is twelve, and in that pH, these enzymes are not active and not working and not working at all. Okay, so it, when they are going to work, when the pancreatic use pH 12 go and into the go into the duodenum, in the duodenum is coming the chyme, the chyme with pH 2 that is very acid. So acid plus alkaline they are going to neutralize like hot water and cold water just to make a, some comparison here, and they are going to be, become warm water. So that means alkaline pH 2, chyme pH 2. Oh no, Alka pancreatic use alkaline pH 12 and the chyme gastric uh, with pH 2, 12 and 2 neutralize. Alkaline versus acid. This neutralization is going to make the pH go close to 7. And that is where the lipase, amylase, and the protease are going to be activated just then. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So why gallstones? Why alcoholism? Let's start with the gallstones. The gallstones, they are going to come in from the gallbladder. They are going to pass through the cystic duct and they go into the common bile duct, anatomy physiology. So this stone can block, can block the exit of the bile duct that is a common pathway with a pancreatic use. Yes or no? So that stone can be in the ampulla of Bader or the uh, trapped by the odi sphincter. And that is going to prevent the bile and the pancreatic juice getting into the duodenum. But the, the gallbladder is still contracting. The pancreatic juice is still producing pancreatic juice. And what happened? Inflammation. Let's talk about the size of the pancreas. So the inflammation produces accumulation of water. Water is pH 7. So plus the pH 12 of the, of the pancreatic use, what is going to get? It's going to get closer to the neutral pH. And what happened is that the, the enzymes start to activate inside the pancreas. And that is going to be digesting the pancreas. That is called pancreatitis. We okay with that? Yes, sir. Alcoholism. Alcoholism. In alcoholism, basically, these people with uh, patients with alcoholism, uh, the pancreatitis can be resolved in about seven days, the majority. But you don't want to play that game. You don't want to play that game. Why? Because in some of them, the pancreas will be completely destroyed. Why is happening pancreatitis in alcohol? Alcoholism. In alcoholism, the patient is taking alcohol, and what is the effect of the alcohol before the bus and the, all the drug, whatever? They are going to produce diuretics. They are going to lose water. They pee a lot, right? Yes or no? They become dehydrated. So all the secretions on the body are going to be more thicker. And one of these is the pancreatic use. The pancreatic use is going to be a slow in his process because it becomes more thicker because the patient is dehydrated because they're taking alcohol, a lot of pee. And this can produce some obstruction that can produce inflammatory process in the Wilson duct, in the pancreatic duct, producing water coming in and making the pH closer to 7. Closer, no 7, but closer to 7, or go to more neutral environment. And that is where the enzymes are going to be activated and produce pancreatitis. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Pancreatitis. You see a patient with pancreatitis, the classical presentation of the presentation of pain, because it's huge pain, it's enormous pain, it's unbearable pain. The patients feel a pain that is like a belt, a belt here on the 
area of the epigastrium all the way back to the back. So that belt is is uh, is called is a pain in belt, and the patient what he's doing is have having his arms like this, his arms like this, and pushing against the body. That is typically present a typical presentation of pancreatitis. Okay, Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. And plus other complications that we are going the the we did have some some bruises etc. So another time it's not the uh, the coolants the coolant sign that is around the okay another time. So one of the complications that can happen of this is that when the pancreas is being digested because of pancreatitis, this pancreatitis is going to destroy the pancreas and the surrounding tissue around the pancreas. If, if they destroy some, some vessels in the pathway, they are going to produce some bleeding. If they reach the upper portion of the pancreas, they can destroy the diaphragm and that can get into the thorax. So it's a huge complication. So you need to be careful with that. Okay, so what to do with pancreatitis? Alcohol, are you going to take alcohol? No. Uh, no. So are you going to eat something? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> no, pancreatitis, no. Pancreatitis is NPO, completely NPO. Okay. Completely NPO. Makes sense, right? Why? Because if you have pancreatitis, if you have pancreatitis, you whatever you eat, whatever you eat, even water, not even water. So they need to have IV. It's not even water because the, what is producing the secretion of pancreatic use? The distension of the duodenum. The duodenum is the one who produces the CCK. And the CCK is an hormone that is going to make the gut bladder to contract more and the pancreatic used to be produced more, right? In either case, or gallstones or alcoholism, you will have accumulation of pancreatic use in the pancreatic duct. And that can make it even worse, the pancreatitis. Is, is, is that okay? Yeah. Yes. So please, in pancreatitis, is MPO. MPO. You okay with that? Yes, sir. I'm thirsty. I have pancreatitis. Can I take water? No. 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 Okay. So that is making the part. So let's go. Are you kidding me? Oh, okay. Oh, my God. All right, so let's let's do whatever we we can. All right, so cardiovascular. What time is it, please? One eighteen. Okay, let's try to do our best. All right, so coronary artery. So cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease. There is cardinal signs of cardiovascular disease that we are going to learn in medicine, in pathology. This is nutrition, so that's why I wish I could do it. All right, so we have. Question for the exam, Mo modifiable factors and non-modifiable factors. So cardiovascular disease can be hypertension, can be atherosclerosis, and you already know, it tell me if you don't to tell you, there is two, two words, the atherosclerosis, and the other one is the arteriosclerosis. It's totally different situation. We okay with that? All right. So if you need to tell me now, because I, I, I'm going to keep going. Coronary heart disease. So if you don't know that, tell me. Okay, coronary disease, heart disease. The coronary arteries are one of the main things that can cause myocardial infarction. You already know by your anatomy physiology that coronary arteries are going to arise from the aorta. These coronary arteries, we have the right and the left, and we have many branches coming towards the myomet myometer, my myocardium of the heart to give blood supply. The coronary arteries that are arising from the coronary, from the aorta, are going to measure about only four millimeters diameter. Only four millimeters diameter. If you eat a lot of cholesterol, a lot of fat, with the time this 
uh, coronary artery arteries are going to get deposit of atherosclerosis. When you eat too much cholesterol, not only the coronary arteries or the carotid arteries are going to be affected, it's all your body, all the vessels of your body are going to be affected. Coronary arteries are going to be blocked. And when you have an obstruction of about 80% of obstruction of cholesterol, you start to have what we call chest pain. Chest pain is called angina. Angina is chest pain. This chest pain, you will feel that is an elephant sitting on your in your chest, on your chest. Okay? So that is important to know, please. Angina. This angina, why it produce pain? Why? Because it's like, imagine that your finger here and put a rubber band in your finger. This rubber band is going to very tight. What is going to cut is the blood supply of the finger. So the blood supply, cutting the blood supply, the finger start to get blue, cold, and then start to be in pain. Why in pain? Because the nerves are not receiving blood supply, oxygen and nutrients, so they start to die. And that the pain is going to happen. In 15 minutes, if you have a tourniquet in the upper and lower stream too tight, you can produce actually the amputation because definitely this all everything is going to be necrotic. The tissue can, especially musculoskeletal, cannot be more than 15 minutes without oxygen supply. Anyhow, and here we have the and so that pain. Imagine that the finger, the muscles, the muscles of the finger is the is the myocardium, the myocardium. So if, if you cut the blood supply of the coronary arteries, that is going, what is going to happen. It's what we call, please write it down, it's called ischemic pain. Ischemic pain. Ischemic pain. So angina basically is an ischemic pain. The pain that I described in your finger, that is an ischemic pain. Okay? And this ischemic pain lead into, result into angina. What is angina? Chain. Chest pain is going to be, typically, the patients are going to come with a fist like this and push it against the thorax. And that is how they try to calm, calm the pain. Okay? The pathophysiology is very nice about that. So let's keep going. So coronary heart disease is the, uh, a, it's what we call CAD. It's coronary arterial disease okay all right so the angina can be triggered by exercises why when you're doing exercises your heart need to pump faster so the needs of oxygen are going to be higher when you're doing exercises but if the coronary arteries are blocked you cannot give the supply of oxygen that the myocardium needs. So the heart enters into ischemia, and that leads into angina. That is one step before to have a myotic infarction. In the United States, we have about 700,000 people dying every day, every day, I mean, <laughs> every year in the United States. And that is the number one cause of mortality in the in, in United States. Okay, we got it? Yes. Got it. So here we have the, the two words, yes. arterial and atherosclerosis. Thank you. So a plaque. What is a plaque? A plaque, please write it down. Plaque is a deposit of cholesterol. It's the same thing. Deposit of cholesterol is a plaque. A plaque or deposit of cholesterol. That plaque or deposit of cholesterol is going to narrow the lumen of the of the coronary arteries, leading into ischemia, and that could produce an infarction. 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 Infarction means death of the tissue. We don't say necrosis. Necrosis is the same thing. So when we are using necro necrosis, is just to tell you that the, the cells, the muscle cells, the myocardial cells are going to die. Necrosis. That is irreversible. Irreversible. When, when the, uh, and that, is being go that is going to be replaced by scar tissue. Scar tissue. So myocardial infarction can develop in heart failure later on. So I'm not going to go on that. So infarction versus necrosis. I want to make it clear. Infarction basically is a term, infarction 
Okay, infarction is necrosis, and necrosis is infarction. But we mostly, uh, we said infarction. Why? Because infarction is more clinical, clinical. Necrosis is when you see in the micro, but it's an histopathological assessment. So, but different both terms are, are the same, but we don't call myocardial necrosis. No, we call myocardial infarction because it's more clinical than histo histological microscopic uh, uh, analysis. Be okay with that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Artery supply in the brain. So that is the same thing. When that happened in atherosclerosis, in atherosclerosis, uh, you have a blockage of the some of the vessels of the of the brain, and that produce the ischemia on the on on that area of the brain, necrosis, infarction of the brain in that area, and some functions of the brain are going to be gone, and that is called a stroke. That is going to be a stroke. The atherosclerosis is going to be like this. If you have here the atherosclerosis here, this is the blood coming this way. The blood is running one meter per second or three centimeters per second very fast. Imagine one meter is this. This is one meter. From your shoulder, put your finger in the shoulder and that, uh, extend your finger, your index. That is one meter. The blood is running one meter per second. One, two, the red blood cells is already there. It's very fast. It's very fast. When you have a plaque here, when you have a plaque or you have atherosclerosis, the friction, friction, I said friction, are going to make some of these pieces of the plaque of atherosclerosis detach and they are going to travel through the bloodstream. And that can is going to match, these sides can match some they go distally, and the more distal, the vessels become more narrow, normally. And this embolus, is called embolus of cholesterol in this case, are going to block that artery, producing, in that area, no oxygen supply, no, uh, no nutrients. And what happened? The patient starts to have what we call uh, an infarction of the brain or necrot infarction of the brain, we call it infarction. Necrotic is the histopathological, but that area is what we call a stroke, a stroke, a stroke, a stroke, a stroke. Are you okay with that? Yes. 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 Risk factor, thank you. Risk factor, gender, male, more than female, until menopause. You already know that, right? That's what I was telling you, atherosclerosis, uh, cholesterol. Choles what is the plaque? What are these plaques? Plaques are cholesterol. And females are protected during the fertile age. But after menopause, the number of myocardial infarctions or MIs are going to be similar as male and female. Age risk increase with age. Why increase with age? Because the atherosclerosis, once it's deposited in the arteries, is not going away. It's staying with you until the end. So if you eat very bad Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, whatever, for 30 years, and you decide to eat rabbit, all vegetables, I am going to be healthy now. No, 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 you already have the atherosclerosis. And what with age? Because patients, patients are going to still eating, and bit by bit, the cholesterol starts to get deposited more and more and more. So that, that's why the more age, you don't have myocardial infarctions in, 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 in children. Myocardial function mostly happening in adult. Family history, so some any group, some group, hereditary conditions. So there is there is family who come in from obese family, obese family. Compound disease, we have metabolic syndrome. So please, if you eat sugar too much for 10 years, it's going to lead into most likely diabetes. In diabetes, diabetes, what happened is going to have hypertension. The, the majority of patients with diabetes is after Let's depend five, ten years, start to develop hypertension. Start to develop hypertension. And that hypertension can produce damage of the endothelium of the vessels. And that injury can make the healing process can produce deposit of cholesterol in that area. All right. High cholesterol levels, your level of cholesterol, you remember, should be less than 200. Less than 200. 
less than 200. Cholesterol, less than 200. Question for the exam. Triglycerides, less than 150. Less than 150. Less than 150. Triglycerides. HDL, HDL should be more than 40. More than 40. More than 40. More than 40. LDL, the bad cholesterol, should be less than 100. Less than 100. Less than 100. Okay? And you can recognize a patient with metabolic syndrome when they have an apple in the abdomen. No, when they have the shape of the abdomen like an apple, apple, apple shape. Okay, so it's what we call central obesity. Central obesity. It's obesity, in that, why? Why central? Because the face, the arms, the lower extremities, the pelvis are normal size. But the only thing that's changing is the abdominal area. We okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So reduce high cholesterol. Uh, all right. So let me see. Yeah. Okay. So this is something I, I want to. Oh my God. I want to cry. Okay. So avoid trans. So one, you, you, you know, balanced diet, balanced diet is the key here. Exercises is the key here, okay? Reduce the risk. So you are going to decrease the, you're going to in, uh, decrease the ingestion of cholesterol. So total cholesterol intake should be less than 200 milligrams per day. So the, the, di the daily uh, uh, requirement intake is going to be 300 milligrams per day. So you need to decrease your levels of cholesterol. That doesn't mean you're going to ban and sweep out all the cholesterol from your diet. Why? Because you need cholesterol, right? Cholesterol is needed for what? For the formation of aldosterone, cortisol, sex hormones. They are going to form the vitamin D. They are going, cholesterol is needed for to form the bile acids. Remember that? The cholesterol is needed for the cell cell membrane. So we have cholesterol, and we need cholesterol anyhow. So you cannot suppress the whole cholesterol, but you need to decrease the cholesterol. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Mediterranean type diet, low sodium. Okay. Uh, uh, what is this? Yes. Decrease. So basically, you need to decrease your cholesterol levels as doing check every time you eat a doritos or something check the level how many i don't know how many milli, uh, milligrams of cholesterol they have for serve okay so am i am i irreversible necrosis irreversible necrosis so that means that the cells who are dead in this ischemic ischemic ischemia and necrosis are not being replaceable they are going to be replaced by non-new cells but for scar scar tissue and this scar tissue are going to make loose the the, the heart the distensibility when they have diastole they need to the compliance of the heart is going to be lost with this scar tissue so there's a decompensation of the of the volume of the volume of blood in the cavities of the heart that can lead into heart failure, into the heart failure. So if the heart cannot pump out all the blood because they lost the elasticity, basically after myocardial infarction, the compliance of the heart is at the, before was like that. But now when you have a myocardial infarction, besides that some amount of fibers are not working you cannot contract and relax because it's, it's replaced by scar tissue instead to do this now it's doing this right less strength less is less strength to contract because you lost already some myocardial cells and that produce accumulation of, of blood because the blood is keep coming to the heart but the heart cannot pump everything out because they lost some muscle already so what happened? The heart start to distend because it start to accumulate because the heart cannot eject all the blood out. So, but the blood is keep coming. So the cavities start to distend, 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 distend. And the heart is so much distended sometimes that the heart cannot actually contract anymore. 
remember that the heart is going to be like a rubber band. So a rubber band, you pull the rubber band, the rubber band is pulled you back. If you st st stretch out the rubber band more, the rubber band is pulled you back with more strength. But the rubber band, if you distend it too much, the rubber band is going to break and the, and the rubber band cannot contract anymore. That is what happened with a heart failure. Heart is failing. You okay with that? For that, you need to decrease the volume of blood. How are you going to do that? Decreasing the salt. Salt to uh, normal, no problems with a person with no disease, is two, uh, two grams per day, 2,000 milligrams per day. But if you have myocardial infarction, they can lead in heart failure or heart failure, you need to decrease your salt. Your salt. Why? Because salt retain water, increase the volume, cardiac output, right? And increase the blood pressure, and the heart is failing. How you, uh, how the heart is going to, uh, 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 I mean, develop that pressure if the heart is failing? So what is happening? Accumulation of fluid, of water. So you, that's why you need to decrease your salt. What you, you need to do is, please, you need to use sub, uh, uh, salt substitutes. Salt, write it down this, please. Salt substitutes. Salt substitutes. What is a salt substitute? It's potassium. 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 Potassium in the periodic table is very close to the sodium, liter sodium, potassium, etc. And we have here that they are very close, so properties are similar, but not exactly the same. That's why there's different elements. But some properties are similar, and the taste of the potassium is similar of the sodium. So because these people nourishment, you need to pre, you need to worry about the nourishment because the patient if they don't eat salt, so, that the the food doesn't taste at all anything. They don't feel any any taste on the food. So that's why you use substitute of, of sodium that or salt, salt or sodium is called, is the same, is to be substitute of, 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 of uh, salt is the potassium. Potassium. Improve the taste, it's not going to be the same, but it's better than nothing. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay, in hypertension, hypertension is once you are being diagnosed with hypertension is forever. Once you are being diagnosed with hypertension is forever. So we have primary, that's what you need to know, please. Primary and secondary hypertension. Primary is called essential hypertension. So we don't know what is the cause. So can you cure hypertension? No, you cannot cure hypertension. Hypertension is going to be for the rest of your life. We don't know what is really the cause of hypertension. So what is all this medication? This medication is just to control the disease. It's like in diabetes. In diabetes, you cannot cure diabetes. You are going to control the diabetes. That is different. Okay? So primary is essential or idiopathic. I'm not going to add more names. Primary, essential, that is unknown origin. And the secondary hypertension, is, is a known cause. We know the cause. Secondary hypertension, for example, uh, uh, at the level we are right now. So what could be secondary hypertension that we know the cause? Is, for example, the narrowing, listen to this, the narrowing of the renal arteries. The narrowing of the renal arteries. Listen to this very carefully, please. Why the narrowing of the renal arteries can happen? Because you know by your AMP that the renal arteries are coming from the aorta. And when you have atherosclerosis, that is going to narrow not only the aorta, but the renal arteries. So the renal arteries, when they have this atherosclerosis, are going to bring less blood to the, to the kidneys. When this less blood caused by the atherosclerosis is a partial blockage, the kidney is going to perceive that it's not having enough blood, and the kidney will think that it's not enough pressure. That's what they think, the, the kidney. And what is doing the kidney in this case? It starts to release the renin. The renin go to the liver to produce angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1 go to the lungs to produce angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 go to the adrenal gland, adrenal gland to produce aldosterone, and the aldosterone go to the kidney again and to reabsorb water, uh, sodium and water. 
in the they are trying what they are trying to do because the kidney was thinking there was a low pressure the kidney with these drugs are going to increase the volume of blood bringing water through the reabsorption of sodium increasing the, the cardiac output increasing the blood pressure that is a second so we know very well what is the cause of the secondary hypertension other causes of hypertension the pheochrocytoma tumors in the adrenal gland the hyperaldosteronism Crohn disease many others but i'm just telling you what i want to ask you for the exam is what is the classification so someone seems to know very nice right so hypertension classification primary and secondary we okay with that yes sir with this we uh, and with this basically sodium re uh, restriction potassium supplements potassium etc right so but now i tell you in the previous you can save patients right now you are the level you are at the beginning of your of your program you can save life i told you if you have if you are able to talk to a patient with hypertension to decrease his blood pressure five millimeters of mercury only from the systolic or more would be better you decrease the risk for strokes decrease the risk for atherosclerosis how hypertension can cause a stroke or myocardial infarction remember remember we were talking about the the vessel and the cholesterol levels here right the blood is running hand one meter per second remember that yeah so if you have their friction already friction they are going to slough off a piece of that that is going to block all the coronary artery or can block some vessels on the brain so if you have hypertension the pressures are going to be higher so it's more risk to detach some portion of this atherosclerosis and that's what they can lead into a stroke or they can have into myocardial infarction make sense yeah only one oh my god okay <laughs> I'm going to start asking. So please don't. Why you leave me alone, please? I really make me nervous when so. I I, I would yes, make some sound like mm, in, yeah, ooh, whatever. At least just to let me know that you are here, please. We're here. Okay. All right. So let's let's keep going. So this is coming for the exam. This is coming for the exam. Nice. We have normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. Pre-hypertension, 120 up to 139. And the diastolic pressure, that is where the volume of the, the, the ventricles are filled up with this volume of blood, are going to be 80 to 89. So this, what you need to do is lifestyle, exercises, diet. That's it. That is well pre-hypertension. You are not uh, hypertensive yet. A stage one, a stage one, you have 140 up to 159. And diastolic 90 to 99. So we have diet and exercises plus one type of drug, one drug. Type one, Stage one, sorry, stage one, one type of drug. A stage two, when it's more than 160, or the, the or diastolic, or I said, uh, or, or is more than 100, the diastolic. In this case, you're going to use the same exercise diet plus two drugs, at least, two drugs. So a stage two. How to remember this? Let me see if I have that. No, I don't have that. It's going to be nine, nine, nine. One nine nineteen nine is like nine nine one nine 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 one one is going to be one nine nine. So don't get confused, please. Just remember the rule of ninety and nine. If you have hundred twenty at nineteen, it's going to be hundred twenty up to hundred thirty nine. You go the next number is hundred forty at nineteen is nine hundred forty plus nineteen hundred fifty nine and above hundred sixty is a stage two. The same thing with the diastolic. In the diastolic, less but not equal 80, 
is going to be 80 plus 989. It's pretty hypertension. Then the next number is 90. 9, 90 plus 999 is stage one. And above 99 is 100. So it's stage two. Easy to remember, right? So that is a question in your packet, I'm telling you. So please. Dash, well, already, we already talked about that. Uh, okay. All right, so let's talk about kidney disease. How many? Oh, my God. Okay. Why am I wasting time? Okay. Wasting time checking, if I know. Okay. Okay, so here we are going to just mention a few things. I want you to remember very well, very well. So I'm going to tell you it very well. Here we have fresh, right? Fresh. Just remember, fresh, filtration, reabsorption, excretion, secretion, hormones, red. Red is the renin, is the erythropoietin, and uh, is the vitamin D. You okay with that? Yep, yes. Okay. Another thing I want you to remember is this. We have here the kidney. This is the kidney. The kidney. This is the kidney. We have the medulla here. The medulla, right? Medulla triangles here. Medulla, medulla. Here we have the cortex, correct? Cortex, correct? Yeah. Yes or no? This yeah. is the yeah. medulla. Medulla. And one thing I want you to remember is this. That we have a renal capsule. Huge, please. Renal capsule. Renal capsule is not the kidney, huh? Renal capsule is a membrane covering the kidney. Here. This membrane. That is called the renal capsule. That is the renal capsule. This renal capsule, please write it down, is not distensible. That's very important. It's not distensible. It's not distensible. Okay? With that, we are going to have... So we have one here. We do here the renal capsule is renal capsule is not distensible number three uh, you need to know the division of the urinary system we have the upper urinary system and the lower correct the upper is going to be the kidney plus the ureter and the lower is going to be the urinary bladder to the ureter you okay with that yes okay yes. perfect so another scene number four you know that nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney. Fresh, right? Each, each nephron is fresh, right? Red. And there have been one million in the right kidney and one million, another million in the left kidney. So if you have 60% of these nephrons dead, are going to produce kidney failure. All right, so we are going to talk about the ER, ESRD, that is the end stage renal disease. End stage renal disease. One of the causes of this is diabetes. Diabetes, right? Okay, so this requires medical nutrition and therapy. Very careful because the kidney, one of the, fu the functions in kidney failure is not working. So, what happened? The, they are going to eliminate to the toxins. So, the urea, for example, they are going to be the creatinine, they need to be eliminated. The nitrogen levels, they need to be eliminated. And the kidney, when it's not working, is going to be actually practically disaster. So they need to do dialysis. Dialysis is taking four hours to five hours. It needs to be done every two to three times per week. So basically, you are living to survive, unfortunately. Okay? So for this, I want, because there is no time or that, that I'm going to go a summary. So we have nephron disease, nephron disease. The nephron disease, in order to know the diet, we need to know the, the, the problems. We have the nephrotic syndrome. So we have two pathologies. The nephrotic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, and the other one is the nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome. The nephritic syndrome is characterized by, for example, UTIs. 
it can lead into UTIs. The UTIs can go into paello nephritis. Paello, paello nephritis. And the other one is the glomerulonephritis. Glomerulonephritis. Paelonephritis is an infection of the urinary bladder, the urinary bladder, basically the urinary bladder plus the ureters. And they can reach the pelvis. Not the pelvis, your pelvis, it's the pelvis of the kidney. Okay, pelvis of the kidney. Paelo nephritis. So inflammation, nephro in this case means kidney. This is kidney, means kidney. So inflammation of the kidney of the of the urinary bladder, ureters, or pelvis. The glomerulonephritis is going to be an, an a problem that is at the level of the nephrons of the nephrons, of the nephrons, okay? Now, nephritic syndrome are characterized by hematuria. Hematuria, when you have, you can have micro hematuria. That means that in the urine, you will have more than three red blood cells per field. What does it mean per field? So they make, this is a microscope, laminate, uh, whatever, and they put a drop of, of, of urine here. They put another laminate here, and here in this laminate is like a, a is draw here like a circle with a lot of squares. So basically in the microscope, you will see like this, a lot of squares. This, each square is a field. When you feel, when you have Two, up to two, that is normal red blood cells. But if you have one, two, three here, or one, two, three here, or four, that is micro hematuria. So that is going to be, when it's three or more, three or more, three or more red blood cells per field, that is micro hematuria. That is characteristic of nephritic syndrome. So hematuria and hypertension, that is the characteristic of this uh, uh, nephritic syndrome. Who is going to, because UTI, not necessary, but the UTI can develop into paelonephritis. That is the moment that you can have uh, actually a nephritic syndrome. More remarkably, it's going to happen when the bacteria, they go to the urinary bladder, go to the pelvis or to the ureters, uh, is pa paelonephritis, they are going to be actually uh, keep traveling and they reach the, the nephrons, the glomerulonephritis. And when they reach that, that is called, uh, they are going to produce this very remarkably hypertension and loss of blood in the urine. In the nephrotic syndrome, the pathology that you need to remember is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus. In this diabetes mellitus, Oh, I have seven minutes. Good. Diabetes mellitus. This diabetes mellitus produces nephrotic syndrome. What is the characteristic of nephrotic syndrome? The nephrotic syndrome basically is the loss of proteins. Nephro, pro, proteins. You lose a lot of proteins. You're losing a lot of protein. And as a consequence of that, if you're losing these proteins, you start to have edemas. Make sense or no? Or you want to elaborate? It makes sense because you're losing protein and um, water follows protein. Exactly. Uh, what? No. <laughs> water is going to be held by the proteins. Yes. In the intravascular space. If you don't have proteins, the water starts to escape and accumulate as edema. We okay with that? Yes. Okay. So, all right, so if you're going to have nephritic syndrome or nephrotic syndrome, you can tell, all right, so we are not talking about dialysis. Huh? We are not talking about dialysis. Dialysis was in the first part. Here we have, uh, in dialysis, what you need to do is to 
have exactly the amount of energy that you need to have in that patient. So that's why it's in, in di dialysis, you need to give that exactly the amount of proteins that is required. A little bit of excess is going to be a problem because the kidney is not screening the urea. Okay, so basically proteins. So in that case, you need to have very high quality proteins. So in a small amount, a small amount and high quality amount of protein. In the frotic syndrome, you are losing protein. So what is the main solution about, about that? Just to control diabetes. The problem in the frotic syndrome, you're losing blood, anemia. So you need to actually resolve the disease, the infection, because this is an infection. Okay, we got it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is a baby there. No, sorry, that's my dog. No, maybe like, okay. All right, so here we have to go to kidney stones. Let me see if I have, oh, okay, perfect. We've, all right, so kidney stones. Those are the stones of the kidney. So please, listen carefully, please. Listen carefully. We are going to talk about, about hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis means accumulation of fluid in the kidney, within the kidney. And that happened because the we have here the, the kidney, they're going to have the pelvis, they're going to go down to the ureter, and they go down to the urinary bladder, the urinary bladder. Okay, now let's suppose here we have, I'm going to draw it like this. So this is the pelvis where the urine is coming here, right? Yes or no? Yes or yeah. no, please. Yeah. yeah. So the urine is going to come here and we have here the first narrowing that is the paello-ureteral uh, junction. Then we have the iliac junction and then okay, we have different narrowings, okay. So what, what is important about this? Important about this, if you have a stone here, the stone can be detached and coming all the way here. And that is going to block the ureter. When you block the ureter, the urine is still pro being produced and the urine starts to accumulate, accumulate, distending the ureter. Ureter or seal, whatever. So they're going to distend the ureter and the fluid start to accumulate in the kidney because of the obstruction, these fluids start to accumulate, 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 and there is increase of pressure here, increase of pressure here. When they increase the pressure, all the medulla are going to push against the cortex, hydronephrosis. They are going to push the medulla against the cortex. And remember the renal capsule here? Remember we was mentioned the renal capsule? Remember? Yes. Yes. The renal capsule is not distensible. We say that, right? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So if the renal capsule is not distending, so the fluid are going to accumulate, accumulate, make pressure over the cortex. So the cortex is going to be totally squeezed, killing all the nephrons. Because the renal cortex, this is the is out is is not a kidney. Renal cortex is a capsule that is very rigid membrane surrounding the the kidney. That is capsule membrane is the capsule renal capsule is no kidney. Is a membrane surrounding the kidney that is going to make the pressures of the hydronephrosis push the the medulla against the cortex, squeezing all the poor nephrons, and the nephrons are going to collapse with that with the blood supply, because the vessels are going to collapse, there is no blood supply, and the nephrons are going to die. So how to prevent kidney stones? The nutrition portion is to prevent, if you have kidney stones, you need to decrease your intake of calcium. And basically, you need to do exercises, okay? Okay? Yes. Ah, okay, so what time is it? We finish on time. See, I, I, oh, two o'clock. Wait, wait. 
Ok. Ok, how was the lecture? Was okay, feedback. Was a uh, so so or well, you like it? Kind of overwhelming. <laughs> overwhelming? A little bit, yeah. But tell, tell the curriculum, don't tell me. The, the, the curriculum is like, like that. So, so, what I can do? Just uh, abo uh, pre oh my God, that dog is nice. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that is the accelerate program, I guess. So, that is part of the curriculum. So, I don't have control on, on which topics are coming or not. But basically, if you're going to read the whole lecture alone, you will be lost. So I need to put all the material that the curriculum is asking me to do, but my job is to guide you on what is important, what is not. Uh, everything is important, but I need to prioritize what is important for your coming courses. So, okay. So, all right. So any other question? No. No questions. Okay. All right, so thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm for, I told you I'm going to finish 10 minutes before. It's, it's impossible to finish 10 minutes before. So I, I use even the last squeeze of water of the of the time. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy as much as I enjoy this time. And I will see you when? Uh, Monday. Monday. Monday is our last class. And next, the coming Wednesday is our final no, our final. So it's it's a nice final. It's not just cal do your practice in your um, calculations, please. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you, G. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Happy good night. Thank you. Too. Bye. I'm going to stay until the end if somebody needs to say something. Miss Kyla. Oh, sorry, Dr. G. I'm uh, I'm hanging out. <laughs> Yeah, all right. So I'm going to see you at the school. Yes. All right, dear. See you then. I right, see you. I'll bring your computer and your uh, uniform. Okay. Okay, thank you. Ivona is coming too, right? Are you contacting yeah, me? I mean, I talked to her earlier. Okay. So, all right. Perfect. All righty. See you.